Thank you, choir and orchestra. Thank you very much. Praise the Lord. Welcome to our visitors today. We trust that you have experienced the presence of the Lord in a special way today. And we do uh, hope that you will take advantage of our hospitality and meet some New Yorkers who will try to answer your questions about the church and the city as they're able. <clears throat> and uh, we're just delighted to have you visit with us today. Uh, They've just released my new book called Hallowed Be Thy Names. I think after the service will be available back there. Subtitled, Knowing God as You've Never Known Him Before. Uh, the names of God, this is a different approach. Uh, God's name revealed only in a time of crisis. Every name of God was revealed in a time of somebody's crises. And they represent your crises and mine. And uh, they're available back there. Enough for that. Amen, somebody said. <laughs> Visitor, I'm sure. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> now this, uh, by the way, uh, continue to pray for Pascar. He'll be back here next Sunday, and uh, he will show the film and also give a full report, and there'll be testimonies of the great moving of God's Holy Spirit. Our choir, uh, Pastor Carter, and a team of 120, I think, or somewhere about that, went to the Philippines for 10 days and had a mighty moving of God. Over 12,000 people were converted, and uh, God did a mighty work there, and <clears throat> you'll get a full report. I would rather he be here to tell you about it. <clears throat> Uh, this church has been very well fed. A lot of preaching on doctrine, a lot of preaching on how to, how to live the Christian walk. And uh, in fact, this book, How Would Be Thy Names, represent, I think, 12 messages that were preached from this pulpit. And uh, <clears throat> so th there's been a well-rounded uh, ministry here from the, all the pastors of this church and the many pastors and evangelists that we trusted to bring to you to this pulpit. This morning, I want to preach to sinners. I want to preach evangelistic message, and, and I really believe God's aiming at a few people that he knew would be in this service tonight, or this morning. I'm amazed how God arranges services just to get to one or two people. Maybe you were one of those that God got to in, in a church service that he arranged just for you. And some that are sitting here this morning are going to feel that somebody has ratted on you and called me and told me about you. That's the way the Holy Spirit works. Marvelous work of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I ask that you let me stand before this people today in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, this is your gospel. Lord, I, I'm, I'm fishing. You said we're fishers of men, and I'm fishing for some people that are here this morning and others that are going to be hearing this on video or, or on audio tapes. And Lord Jesus, they're in a condition they believe is hopeless, absolutely helpless. They believe that they're beyond the reach of God, that they have sinned away the day of their grace, and they cannot be reached. They believe that they are in an impossible situation. Lord, I know better than that, and you've given me a message for them, and I pray that those that are here that are Christians will hear this and perhaps use this as they testify to others, and that from this day on they will never look upon anybody as beyond the scope of the gospel or the reach of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray now that we'll understand that with God nothing is impossible. Now, Lord, anoint me. Let a special unction come upon me. Lord Jesus, I know you're reaching to some people that are here this morning. Lord, how miraculously you arrange things. So I, I need your quickening. I need your touch that I speak as an oracle of God this morning and not of man. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There's a young man who once attended this church who's living in dread and torment. It began the day he, he walked away from God, saying, uh, I've had enough of this preaching, enough of this strict life. He was active in this church. He, he, he was a, a very good testifier. He testified to the grace of God and claimed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And 
was used in street rallies and testifying and ministering to people and counseling with people. But uh, he just got fed up, he said, and he couldn't take it anymore. And he, he just walked out on the Lord. He said the preaching put too much guilt trips on him. And he said, I'm not ready to live this kind of strict life. I've just about had it. I want to enjoy it, a few parties. I'm not going to go too far, too deep into it, but uh, I want a little more fun. I just can't live the life that you people are preaching here at Times Square Church. So he just left, forsook the Lord. Now, he, he was not a heathen. <clears throat> he was one who was fully equipped with the gospel truth. He, he understood the things of God, eternal truths, the truths about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and future events. He knew about the Holy Ghost. And now he's a fallen man. He's deep in sin now. He's drinking away uh, an emptiness that was in him. Uh, he's not a believer now. He's turned completely against the Lord. He, he has different partners as often as he can find them, sexual partners, but it's uh, painful and, and uh, so discouraging to him. In fact, he goes home and cries himself to sleep because the last time I, I talked to him, he was weeping. But he said, I've sinned away. I've sinned against so much light. I've sinned away my hope and it just, I just can't be reached. And he, he has this terrible fear that God's mad at him now that he's crossed the line that he can't get back. How many, many thousands of people who've walked out on God who have fallen from grace and they believe that they're beyond the reach of the Holy Spirit. They're beyond the reach of God now because they, they had too much. They knew too much and they've sinned too uh, grossly before the Lord and cannot be saved now. He has this feeling, I'm too far gone, I'm lost. I received a letter from another young man like that who'd walked out on God, had fallen. He was so deep in sin, he was becoming an alcoholic. And he was haunted at night by all of the sermons he'd heard and all the preaching he'd preached. And he felt like Paul, having preached to others, I myself became a castaway. Paul said that he, he felt that he is living out what Paul warned about. And uh, in his despair one time, he, he wrote, he said, I decided to go to church one more time. Just one more time. And... Uh, he went to a church where the pastor happened to choose his text from Hebrews, the sixth chapter. I want you to turn to Hebrews, the sixth chapter, if you will, please. Hebrews, the sixth chapter, and, and in the annex in our overflow rooms, uh, I want you to follow me. I want you to read this with me, if you will, please. The sixth chapter of Hebrews, verses four through six. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. It is impossible for these kind, the scripture says, if they should fall away to renew them again to repentance. And the pastor of the church that morning preached from this text, and he made it clear there is no possible chance if you fit the description of this fallen man. And he sat in that pew and he said, that's me. I, I have put Christ to an open shame. I've been enlightened. I've sinned against light. I've tasted the heavenly gift. I've tasted the word of God. In other words, I have eaten the word of God as it was preached. I was made partakers of the Holy Ghost because I know the Holy Ghost was in my life. It filled me. I have tasted the good word of God, the powers of the world to come. I've seen into eternity. I've preached about heaven and hell. And I've fallen away. I know that I'm crucifying Christ daily. I'm putting him to an open shame. And the pastor said, that's it. And he walked out and he said, I am doomed. He wrote me a letter. He said, Pastor Dave, I am doomed. I'm damned. There's no hope. And I, I live under this constant dread and fear. I've crossed the line. I can't get back. And there it is in the scripture. And that's what he said. And he walked out of that church with no hope. There it is. He said, impossible for a fallen 
creature to be renewed, impossible for them to repent if they fit this pattern. Now, this description here in Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, and he said, I'm that man. Now, the letter of hope that I wrote to him is the message I'm going to preach to you this morning. Now, I want you to hear it very closely. You see, over the past 40 years, I have, you know, I, I uh, was the founder of Teen Challenge, a drug program that has over 300 centers worldwide now, and God has blessed it, the highest curate in the world. And over the years, uh, thousands upon thousands of drug addicts and alcoholics and prostitutes and devil worshipers have come through the doors and have been marvelously delivered atheist uh, uh, witches over that were uh, head, heading coven, covens and uh, robbers and thieves and pushers, those considered hopeless by society, and I've seen them delivered. But the devil, when they fall, goes after them, approaches them, uh, seduces them back, and folks, when they go down, having been so blessed, having seen such light and enjoyed such freedom from drugs and alcohol and so many other bondages. And then when they go down, when they fall away and they're enticed by the devil, it, it, they, they, they get this, this conviction. I, I'm too far gone. I can't be reached. It's impossible to reach me. I'm thinking of a young couple a number of years ago that came, James and Mary Thomas, they walked in like two dead people. They had been on the streets, and how they stayed together, I'll never know, because she was not only a drug addict, she was an alcoholic, and he was hooked on heroin. They would rob and steal. They lived on the streets, and they walked in. Now, he'd, he'd been a, they'd, they'd been a very fine, intelligent young couple, but we had a term we used there when they came in. His mind was fried, and... You talk about a young man with a fried mind. It was James Thomas. He could hardly speak his name. He stuttered. She was a pitiful, pitiful sight, skin and bone, diseased. We took them into Teen Challenge Center here in Brooklyn. And God did a marvelous thing in the next month. God so saved them, filled them with his mighty Holy Spirit. What a miracle it was. God began to uh, bring health and color back to their cheeks and strengthen their bodies. They began to gain weight. And God did something supernatural, especially for James. He so healed that mind, absolutely healed him. He would, he would go down every week into to Brooklyn to a, a Jewish, an elderly Jewish man uh, who spoke Hebrew, and he self-taught himself with this man, self-taught himself Hebrew. He self-taught himself Greek. Brilliant man. God restored his mind. He was, he had, it, it was a genius mind that had been warped and uh, fried, as we say, by sin. And God healed her of alcoholism and drugs, and God restored their marriage. We sent him to Bible school, and he, in fact, his Hebrew teacher said, I can't teach you anymore, you know more than I do. Graduated with honors. They went to California and started a prison ministry. And Mary and James Thomas were two of our prized examples of the grace of God, trophies of grace. And for... A number of years, for 10, 12 years or so, I don't know the exact number of years, they ministered together. She was by his side ministering, a very strong uh, help meet, working with many, many prisoners. She ministered, she uh, counseled with women that were in trouble. But somehow, in, in I, I don't know the whole story, but the devil came and discouraged her began to entice her back to alcohol, to begin to drink on the side. And James found out about it and prayed, and he was heartbroken that his wife, he saw her slipping away. And then one night she didn't come home. He went out and he found her in a bar. 
She said, James, I don't know what's happened. I just can't break it. I'm back again. And for the next months, it was a living hell for James because he would go out at night and have to pick his wife up off the streets. Prostituting. And James so loved her, he wouldn't give up on her. He said, I'm not going to quit on you. I know what God did for you. And I know what God did for us. And I need you. But he would call me mourning, heartbroken, because his wife would go out and when he would go to ministry, come home, she was gone. Their daughter turned to drugs. Teenage daughter became a drug addict. The awful example of mother. And one day, James called me. We were living in Texas at the time. Our headquarters, our crusade headquarters in Texas. And, and uh, James called me heartbroken. He said, Brother Dave, I don't know what to do. I'm about to lose my mind. I said, I'm going to send you a ticket. You hop a plane. He was in California. Come and spend a week with me. And we brought him. He wept and cried. He said, I, she went out and I've lost her. I don't know where she is. She's disappeared. She, he got a telephone call the third day. He's with us. She had found out from the daughter where he was. He had, he had told her where he was going. And she called our house. She said, James, I'm in the hospital. She had been found beaten in the in the streets after prostituting the men beat her up and she was in the hospital and she said please come and get me and in his love for that woman he he, he said but Dave I need to get her so I sent I, I gave him tickets and money and you know, got her and brought her to our house and I you can't believe such a battered woman black and blue and swollen eyes and lips and uh, here she was at our house, and after about 24 hours of sleeping, James cleaned her up, and we began to minister to her. But she, she couldn't grasp it. She said, Pastor David, it's too late. I am too far gone. I have sinned against such light. I was a preacher. I ministered the word of God. And God did such miracles in my life. And look at me now. Look what I've done. You talk about putting Jesus to an open shame, crucifying Christ. I've crucified him. She knew this passage of scripture. And she believed she fit that. She was the woman here described in Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. Impossibly renewed if they shall fall away. Because she, she had been enlightened. She had tasted of the heavenly gift. And all of this, this was her described completely. And the devil had convinced her she's beyond hope, destined to be an alcoholic, destined to die on the streets. She nearly died and she said that's probably, that's, she felt that's what she was destined for. Now folks, I want to leave her story for just a minute and I'll come back and tell you the rest of the story. But I want to focus in on this one phrase, impossible to be renewed. My question, impossible to whom? Impossible to whom? Let me give you three impossibilities. First of all, it's impossible for any preacher or Christian worker to reach this kind of person described in Hebrews. It's impossible. Now, Mary knew, Mary, Mary knew I loved her. She knew I was in the scriptures. She knew I was a praying man. She knew that all along. She knew my wife was a praying woman and, and we were trying to minister love to her. She trusted me. She trusted the word I preached. She'd been in my crusade and seen thousands saved in some single meetings. She'd seen the work at Teen Challenge and the change of lives and she knew the gospel I preached was the true pure word of the Lord. But nothing I could say would reach her. Nothing I said could touch her. Not one word of preaching, not one word of loving counseling from James, or, or, or from me or his, her husband. No scriptures, 
No prayers, our love, our compassion, nothing can touch that woman. In fact, Mary's pastor and wife, they attended a church in California. The pastor and his wife had ministered to Mary and had warned her, her pleaded with her, wooings, warnings. Nothing worked, nothing could reach. Because you see, you can come to a place that you get so deep in sin and you become so hardened to the gospel. You get so far out there in that pit of despair that no preaching can reach you. You're beyond conviction. You're beyond being moved. Folks, there's nothing more frightening to see this happening. I've seen this over and over again. People, no matter how I preach, I could be under the greatest anointing. I could preach as an oracle of God. I could have the pathos of the cross. I could have the cry of the very heart of Jesus for their soul. And yet they're totally unmoved, untouched. It's impossible for any human being to reach this person described. And some of you that are sitting here now, you say, that's me, Brother Dave. I sit through sermons and I sit through preaching where the Holy Ghost is manifest and it doesn't move me anymore. It doesn't touch me. Beyond feelings, beyond conviction, and I've heard them admit, I feel like on the brink of a black hole, and that hole is endless, and I'm about to sink into it, and when I know I get into that hole and begin to fall, I'm lost, I'll never get out. Jeremiah 7.27, the prophet said, Thou shalt speak all the words to them, but they'll not hear you. You shall call to them, but they'll not answer you. Jesus preached to the sinful multitudes of his time who had hardened their hearts to his message. And he said, for this people's heart is wax gross or hard. Their ears are dull of hearing. They've shut their ears and their eyes. Oh, yes, folks. I, I've seen many through my preaching be saved. I've seen the worst sinners be saved. But they were hardened by sin and not hardened to the gospel. There's a difference. But you see, that you can become so hardened to the gospel. You can become so hardened because you've been so enlightened previously. I'm telling you that it is impossible for any preacher or any Christian worker to get through with a message. Not that the gospel's lost its power. No, 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 no. I'm still seeing multitudes come to Jesus through the preaching of this pulpit. That's not it. The gospel has not lost its power. But some people have put themselves beyond the pale. They have gone to a place that is so far in their own minds. It's a mindset that they have established through these suggestions from hell and from the devil himself. I can't be reached. I've sinned too much. I've, it's against it's absolutely impossible for me to be reached and so that no preacher can reach them, no witness can reach them, no personal worker can reach them. Oh, I've seen it all over the world. Secondly, it's impossible at times for loved ones and friends to reach them. Nobody loved his wife more than James. I said amazed because I, I was saying to myself, if... If, if my wife ever walked out and had been handled by men and drunken and picked up off the street, I'd think she's diseased. I wouldn't touch her. The Lord just have to tell me, maybe I'd put her in an institution or something. But I sure didn't have that kind of grace. I knew it. Now, I don't know. You, sometimes you don't get grace till you need it. But in my own mind, I know what I'm like. And I, I didn't have that kind of thing. And I know my wife, if I ever cheated on her, she said, there's the door, buddy, and that's it. That's a great motivation to holiness, I'll tell you. I watched him wash her face and caress her wounds and weep over her. And I watched him take her out when she got a little strength to walk. This was, uh, we lived on our, our headquarters was on a ranch in Texas. And I watched him walk up the country roads hand in hand. 
But folks, there was no amount of human love could break through to that woman. It was not human love. I have seen wives whose husbands have left them for another woman. And this man's got children. He's been married for 25 years or more. Thinking of one, one particular, and, and you, you, this man comes home to get his clothes. He's found another woman and he's leaving. And he, he's been gone for three months and here he comes for his clothes. And I've seen and listened to women who have cried and wept and said, Honey, I forgive you. Come back. I don't care what you've done. If you just tell me where I went wrong, if you'll just help me. I want our marriage to work. And then there are the children, and she's already informed them, and he's informed them he's leaving. Those children have grabbed his legs and crawled on his lap and said, Daddy, how can you do this? Don't do this to Mommy. Don't do it to us. Don't leave us. And those men have walked out unmoved, absolutely unmoved. No amount of love, no amount of human compassion, nothing could reach them because they were already hooked. They were already gone. I remember a pastor friend of mine. He was a director of one of our teen challenge centers. Fine young man, married to a beautiful young lady. And he had a wonderful work. He, he won many drug addicts. Lord, he was one of our best soul winners on the streets. One of a, a, a fine young man. And I loved them both dearly. But he started playing around with pornography. And he got hooked. And he got angry at his wife because she would not sit and watch the filth with him. He said, I want you to be a part of this. He said, I, I, I'm not going to break it. I'm going to continue it, but I want you with me. And, and he, he was so angry, she said no. And it was a rebuke to him. Her stand rebuked his immorality. It was a terrible rebuke to him. But he wouldn't let go. She called me. When and I invited her, she came to our house. And we ministered to her. She said, I, I, I tried it for a little while just to keep my husband, but I got so convicted, I walked out and I said, no, no, I'll not touch this. I don't want the devil. You let open your, whole, your soul to the devil. And if you're not careful, the devil will possess you. Folks, when you do that, you open your soul to demon possession. She said, Brother Dave, you ought to hear his preaching now. It's dead. He has nothing to say to anybody. His mind is so warped. He came in one day and said, I'm leaving you. She said, how can you do that? Why, why don't we go and see Brother Dave? So he came. They came again to my house. And he, I, I, I witnessed to him. I prayed with him. He knew I loved him. I was his friend. I, I said, look, no matter what you've done, there's power in this room right now. I can take authority if you just believe with me. We'll take authority over this now. You'll be delivered. And he said, it, it's too late. Words to that effect. I, I am so into this. I can't. And he's, he knew Hebrews. He knew this. He had this thought the devil put in his mind. You're too far gone. You're hooked now. There's something in your past. There's a curse. This must have been your father, your grandfather, and you're part of that curse. Oh, I hear that from those who go back and get hooked on alcohol. Well, my dad was an alcoholic. My granddad was an alcoholic. I've heard him say, my dad died on the street as an alcoholic. They come into our centers. I, I, I am this because I am inheriting the, the, the demonic genes of my father and my grandfather. Folks, yes, the devil does work down through generations, but I'm going to tell you, greater is the power of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus. He's able to break every curse and set everyone free. I, I, I grieved as they left our place. He left his wife and married a witch. Married a witch and went into the occult. I have lost touch with him. I don't know where he is. But he would tell you, 
I am beyond hope. I'm beyond the reach of God himself. You see, human love and human ties and human compassion cannot reach some. Not even, thirdly, not even the fear of death, hell, or judgment will not touch them. You see, Mary understood full well that the wages of sin is death. She knew that every evil thing she was doing now was being recorded in the book because she once preached that. And she knew that she'd stand one day before the judgment seat and have to answer for it and only add it to her burden and her guilt. She used to warn others to flee from the wrath of God. But now, you can preach hell, fire and brimstone. You can warn her. You can threaten her with the scriptures and the wrath of God, but it doesn't mean a thing. Now, Jesus cried to hardened Pharisees, Fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell, and it never fazed them. He warned of fire and brimstone, of being caught, cast into a bottomless pit. He warned, you are in danger of hell, fire, and it, like water off a duck's back, it didn't mean a thing to them. I've told you the story from this pulpit. A teenage boy who met me right here in 50th Street, I think it was. And he, he said, could you go over with me here at St. Clair's Hospital, it's two blocks from here. He said, would you go over? My, my brother's dying from AIDS, and he's got a few hours left, and I, I just saw you on the street. Would you come right now and pray for him? You heard me tell this story, but it fits right here now, and I have to tell you this. I, I said, now, let's go right now. And I went over to St. Clair's Hospital, and he'd been given a few hours left to live. Walked in, and this teenage boy said, this is our, my pastor. I go to Times Square Church, and... And, and you're dying, and I ask him to come and pray for you. You need Jesus. He'd been witnessing to him. And the kid had one of those TV sets that's, that's on a pivot, and it, he would pivot right over his bed. And uh, he was watching a, a shoot 'em up movie, you know, a detective's movie, and he, he wouldn't even look at me. He, he was so intrigued with it. Now, he's about to die. And he can't miss the end of this program. <laughs> now, it sounds funny, but folks, can you imagine the blindness that Satan brings with sin? Here's a young man who knew the way. He knew the truth. It's not new to him. And I, I said, I pushed the TV aside. He pulled it back. I, and I pushed it again. I said, look, and it got right over the bed put a finger on his chest and said, you are about to go to hell. Within hours, you're going to be in hell unless you call on the name of the Lord now. You're a dead man. You're dying. You're going to be in hell and you're going to have the devil looking in your face. And there was a Holy Ghost power on me and a, a spiritual anger against the devil. And, and I said... Can I pray for you? And he says, I don't care. But he was looking at the TV. I prayed a simple prayer and, and, and walked away. And I just, I went to the door and I looked back and he pulled the TV sitting over there. And his, his brother is crying and, and, and uh, can't believe this. This man's about to die. He knows he's dying as a drug addict. Uh, dying of AIDS and from a dirty needle and <laughs> goes out into eternity watching a movie. You see, the death, the threat of hell meant nothing. I have listened to fallen Christians tell me Brother Dave, hell doesn't bother me. I'm already there. It's hell to wake up every day with a black cloud hanging over your head. It's hell to be driven by a habit you can't control. He said it's hell to live through the day hoping for the night and through the night can't wait for the morning. He said I'm in hell because every pleasure I have gives me no more joy. Sex means nothing. 
Drugs mean nothing. Parties mean nothing. I still go and every Friday or Saturday I get that party spirit come upon me and I go and go home and cry. I'm in hell. It's hell to be shut off from God. It's hell to know you spit in God's face. That's hell. Yes, friends, it's true. It's impossible when you're in this condition and you've sinned against light and you're crucifying Christ daily and you put him to an open shame and you have tasted all the good word of God. Yes, and when you fall and get further and further away from the cross, further and further away in, in, in the lifestyle and deeper and deeper into sin, yes, it's impossible for any preacher to reach you. I don't. Ha I know that my preaching here tonight, is, this morning, is not going to reach some of you. And I'm moving you. I know that. I know that when I go out witnessing on the street and talk to some, I know that they're looking beyond me. They're yawning. They, they're nothing, I say. I can hug them, love them. I can give them money. That doesn't mean anything. I'm telling you, friends, loved ones, compassion doesn't do it. And preaching hellfire doesn't do it. The fear of God is not upon them. It is impossible. But nowhere in this scripture does it say that it's impossible for God to do it. My Bible says, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. Nothing shall be impossible. The only people that are impossible are those who committed the unpardonable sin. There is a sin that will not be forgiven. That is the unpardonable sin. And I will tell you, there's one way to know if you've ever committed the unpardonable sin. One positive proof. If you're afraid that you've done it, you haven't done it. Because you wouldn't be thinking about it. You wouldn't be concerned about it. You know, you see, those who committed the unpardonable sins are those who purposely reached into their heart and ripped out Christ. And said, everything that I've ever known about Christ was the work of the devil and not of the Holy Ghost. It's that one who shakes a fist at God and says, I never want to hear from you again. And they attribute everything that God is doing on the face of the earth, even in their own lives. They attribute it to the devil himself. And they are those, homosexuals included, who say Jesus was gay. And if you see the homosexual parade here, you'll see a hundred signs saying Jesus is gay. Jeremiah 30. Don't turn there. God said to Israel, now listen to this closely. I'm going to prove my point that it's not impossible for God to reach this person who thinks they're beyond hope. He said to Israel, your bruise is incurable. He's talking to stiff-necked, backslidden, idolatrous people of God. Your bruise is incurable. In other words, impossibly cured. Your wound is grievous. You have no healing medicines left. Why do you cry because of your affliction? Your sorrow is incurable because of the multitude of your iniquities. That's Jeremiah 30, 12 through 15. You can read it when you get home. Read the 30th chapter and you see God's indictment against Israel. He said, I, you have heard prophets. You have given so much light. The word of God has been revealed to you. All the promises and the covenants have been given to you. And you've turned your back on me. Your awful sins have made you depressed. Jeremiah said you're sick, depraved, diseased. And you're incurably wounded. There's no medicine to heal you. You see, there's no man can help you. You're beyond the help of humankind. There is no human answer to your problem. But I want you to listen to this now. Two verses later, listen to what God says. I will restore health to you. He's just said they're incurable. He just said it's impossible. But something happened between this 
And what God is saying now, something happened in the heart of God. He saw something. I will restore health to you. This is in verse 17. In verse 15, it says it's incurable. Verse 17, two verses later, I will restore health to you. I will heal you of all your wounds, saith the Lord, because they called you an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeks after. God saw something. He, he saw fallen people and he saw the whole world and the devil looking at them and saying, God's given up on them. God has given up. They're cast away. They have no healing. God has said they're incurable. It's hopeless. And that's what they said about Mary. Even her friends gave up on her. There comes a time when you sin. If you're on drugs or alcohol, especially or some other habit, and, and your friends will give up on you. Even family begins to give up on you. They can't handle it. There were people saying, Mary, they need, James needs to get her and put her in an institution. She needs to be in a mental institution. She needs to be off the streets. And they gave up. And there are some of you listening to me now. You say, that's me, Brother Dave. My wound is incurable. There is no hope for me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know how I've sinned. Folks, you, you could not have grieved God any more than Israel did. These idolaters, he said, you're stiff-necked, idolatrous people. I send you prophets and you mock them. And yet because people were saying, God gives up on people. God has given up on his own children. Zion, because, listen to it again. Because they call you an outcast. And because they say, this is Zion whom no man seeks after. God has abandoned you. God has left you alone because you've sinned too much against him. God said, no, 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 I'm going to move in right now because I'll not let the devil accuse me of that. I'm going to move in right now and I'm going to heal you. And I'm going to cure every wound in your body. God said, the world might give up on you. Your friends and family may give up on you, but I'm not going to give up on you. I'm going to have mercy on you. And that's what God did for Mary. Others had given up on her. She was too far gone. She said she was an outcast. But let me tell you how Mary came through. It wasn't through my preaching. I finally gave up. I had nothing left to say. And it wasn't any love or compassion or anything that her husband could say. It wasn't any fear that got through to her. Because finally, after a week, James told me, he said, this, this, I don't know if she'll ever get through. I, I don't know. I feel so helpless. But one night in the middle of the night, and this is all God looks for, a little cry. Out of the depths, David said, I cried. Out of the depths of despair, I cried. And the Lord heard me. And all she whispered, she couldn't even speak, it was whispered, Lord, help. And God heard it. And then she voiced it, Lord, I'm so down. I am so low. And tears began to flow. And the Holy Spirit moved into that room. And God melted her heart. And the power of his forgiveness came into Mary's life. And just flooded her soul and washed out all the filth, washed out all of the hopelessness and washed out all of the, all of the anger that was in her. She raised her hands and began to worship the Lord. James came in and they hugged and, and James knew that God had done a work in her and sanctified her and changed her very life. You see, with God, nothing is impossible. Out of the depths I cried unto thee, Lord, hear my voice. In my distress I cried unto the Lord and he heard me. Listen, that may be the only thing left. The only way God can reach you. It's that right now, not because of my preaching, 
but strictly because God still loves you. And because everybody else has given up on you, including yourself. God said, I'm not giving up on you, but I've got to hear that cry. I've got to have a cry. That's all I'm looking for. You don't have to give me theology, make me no promises, nothing. Just cry. Cry. Help me, God. Help me. Oh, God did a work. What a joy to send them back to California, back to their ministry, back to the prison ministry. Last year, James died. And last month, Mary followed him. But she went home a warrior for Jesus Christ. Both of them. Perhaps the devil's persuaded you that God has given up on you. David said others were speaking against him, saying, God hath forsaken him. Speaking of David, so persecute him, take him, for there's no one to deliver him. That's what they were saying about David because of his sin. And then David cried out in Psalm 71, 12, same words, oh God, help me. And then he said, Lord, you showed me great sore troubles, but you're going to bring me back again to life. And you shall bring me up again from the depths of the earth. And you'll comfort me on every side. <sighs> One morning before I close. You say that, that's good news, Brother Dave. Maybe there is some hope but if you sit here this morning thinking to yourself well I'll make that cry next week maybe a month from now I'm not quite ready I, I, I still I'm not I really don't want to break this yet I still love my sin oh yeah I can't sleep and I know I'm in hell but I'm not ready I'm going to tell you now, straight out. You're not going to get another one. Because when you come to this place, here now, and you put it off now, when he only asks of you a cry, you won't make that cry. Not because God won't be merciful, not because he, it's impossible to him, but it's because you now have taken that final leap. Because he said today is the day of your salvation. You will never have another moment like this. Now, when I was preparing this and in prayer this last night and this morning, I felt there would be one or two ministers here, either who've been here before or are visiting. And you have fallen. You've left the ministry. Are you, are you active in Christian work? And that's all a memory now. That's all gone. And you're in sin. I'm telling you now, God delivered you a word. If you'll make that cry today and step out of your seat and come and let us pray with you, God will deliver you and restore you. Everything the canker worm has eaten, he'll restore it and give you a new heart and a new beginning. And there are others of you listening to me now. You're in despair. You say, Brother Dave, I just feel like I'm too far gone. I feel like I've sinned so much. I knew so much. I was so blessed. And, and now my heart is cold. I'm drifting away from God. And I'm, I'm beseeching in the name of the Lord to run back to the arms of Jesus. Be renewed in repentance. Stand, please. Beloved, in the, in the annex, if, if you're one of those ministers I'm talking about, if you're in the main floor, even while I'm talking, I'd like you to get out of your seat. And I'd like you to come here and humble yourself before the Lord and just make that cry. 
You probably make that cry in your seat right while you're standing. So Jesus, help me, or God, there's a cry. I, I want you to just get out of your seat. And I want you to come here right now. And we're going to believe God for a miracle, an absolute miracle in your life. God is able to do that, to set you abundantly free. And in the annex, if you see uh, uh, anyone walking forward, I'd like two or three Christians to go and stand by either the man or the woman or two or three, I don't know who will come, and stand by them just to encourage them and to minister to them in prayer. These that are coming, up in the balcony, go the stairs. Don't be afraid to come. You're among friends. I'm opening this altar now to everyone, upstairs, downstairs, and in the annex. When you go forward, I want you to go between the screens. Don't block the, the uh, video walls. Just, just go between the video walls, if you will, please. And in and, uh, and the overflow rooms as well. And I want you, if you, if the Holy Ghost has dealt with you this morning, and you, you, you're on that path, you're going far from God. You're drifting further and further away from Him. I want you to come back now. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to grip your heart. No one will beg you. No one's threatened you. No one's been preaching hell at you. I, I do preach about hell. Jesus preached about it more than I do. Yes, there is a hell. Yes, there is a wrath of God. But today the Lord has come to you with overwhelming love and compassion. So all you can do is cry. Say, Brother Dave, I'm afraid of falling. You, know, you, you let the Holy Ghost worry about that. You come and trust your life to him. It's the Holy Ghost that keeps you in hell. God bless you. Don't be afraid to run. That's it. You can run here. That's desperation. That's, that's saying, Lord, I want freedom. I want deliverance. Wherever you at, all over this building, as we hear this invitational number, get out of your seat. Say, Brother Wilson, God's dealing with me this morning. Folks, don't walk out when the Holy Ghost is dealing with you. Let him speak. Please don't come, though, unless the Spirit is drawing you. Not just out of some emotion, but you come because something deep in your heart is saying, I heard this. This went deep into my soul. Husband and wife, if you if you slipped away from God, if you have fallen, come back to his mercy now. Come back to his grace. Wherever you're at, upstairs, downstairs, and in the annex as well. Those in the annex, I'll tell you what. Why don't you just turn around and go to the lobby and ushers are there. They'll show you how to get down here. Come on down here so I can look you in the eye and pray with you here in the main auditorium, if you will, please. Those that are in the annex and in the overflow rooms, uh, right now, just go back into the lobby. And there's a door. Bring you into this main auditorium and come right here to this altar. I'll wait for you. We'll sing until you get here. And then we'll minister to you. Well, folks, the Holy Ghost is hanging heavy. His spirit is heavy over this service right now with loving conviction and wooing of his spirit to everyone who has an open heart. And even if your heart's been closed, take the step by faith. A broken spirit and a contrite heart, you will not despise. You desire to
could still come while I'm talking. Thank God there were four or five responded to the ministerial call. We'll not isolate them or point them out. That's, that's between them and the Lord. We don't want to embarrass anybody. We're not here to do that or to put on a show. This is life and death. It's life and death. I want you to bow your heads and your hearts, and I want you to pray this from the innermost part of your being, from deep inside. Pray this with me. Dear Lord, help me. I need a miracle. I need a touch. Do for me what you did for Mary. Melt my heart and draw me back to your arms. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Give me a new heart. Take the stone heart out of me. Give me a heart that feels and loves. Thank you, Jesus, that you didn't give up on me. You have reached to my heart, and I've come to you and said, yes, Jesus. Now let me pray for you, Father. In your marvelous grace, your loving kindness, your tender mercies, Oh, Holy Ghost, reach into the heart and pluck out everything that is evil. Pluck out everything that has robbed us of truth and light and hope. Oh, the great love of God. What marvelous love that God should come to broken, fallen mankind and say, I love you. I'll heal your wounds. I'll set you free. The devil can't have you. What a miracle. Lord, that miracle is happening right now to many here. That miracle is happening right now. Don't be afraid to cry. Let those tears come. They can help wash away the fear. Now pray this with me. Jesus, I thank you for your love. You do love me. And you're going to help me to make it. I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to die in sin. I'm going to be with you, Jesus, in glory because of your forgiving power. Thank you, Jesus. Give him thanks right now. I thank you, Jesus. Give him thanks. Give him all my I want to pray. Father, I pray now that the good work that you've begun, you will finish. That you will keep those who have come to you. Lord, I, I, I saw those who responded for the call from fallen, for fallen pastors. And Lord, I see five or six. And I thank you. I've seen some that came, Lord, with, I see their brokenness now. Proves that their heart is not hardened. Now, Lord, when they walk out of here, let them know. Let them know that they can be absolutely free. They can be totally restored. Hallelujah. Thank you for your mercy and your love and your grace. We give you thanks. Now, if, if you were in ministry of any kind, and you're here now, and this message is for you, and you had fallen... And you're drifted, and you're coming back this morning, is what I'd like you to do. I'm going to ask all of our elders to be available, please, uh, right behind stage. And I, I, uh, I want you to inform the, the guard there at the door, the entrance in the back. You just go around the entrance for backstage. All those who have fallen from some kind of ministry, and you need somebody to to just agree with you now and minister to you. I want you to go back and just say, I'm one of those pastors Pastor Dave's calling for, uh, male or female. And if you go back there, we'll, t uh, Pastor Neil, will you see that they're paired up with our, our gentleman here? And just right here on, the curtain will be dropped right here on stage. You're going to be ministered to. 
Now the rest of you, listen please. What room is it we go to, 204? 206. Now listen, we have in room 206 in the annex, we've got some wonderful people, prayer counselors, and powerful in prayer and love. If you would like to have someone pray with you, if there's a great need in your life, look at me now. You're going through something very uh, trying in your life. You need somebody to pray with you, minister to you. If you uh, out in the lobby, in the rotunda, there are those in white jackets. They'll give you direction right up the stairs into the annex to room 204, and they're, they're waiting for you right now. They're, you don't join anything because we don't even have membership here. You don't join anything. You don't ask for any money. You're just going to be ministered to. That's it. That's why God has so blessed this church. Would you turn now? Anyone here? One, one to take, you want somebody to pray with you. Make your way right now because soon the aisles are going to be all blocked and you won't be able to get up there. Uh, just turn right now. Anyone here say, oh, brother, I need somebody to pray with me. I, I would like to have that ministry to me. Turn right now. And, and the ministers, please, you go this way over here right now. Make your way through. And you can, uh, they'll, if you've been in any kind of ministry, go this way, please. Right over here to my left. And you're right. I see three or four going. Just go right on over there, please. And they'll minister to you. And uh, just let them go through, please. God bless you. What a wonderful thing to see. What a miracle we're seeing here right now. God is so good.